around the NFC North. So the Bears, it was, again, they win the game. You have to be happy with the come from behind win. Again, down 17 nothing. Uh, the Titans look like they're in complete control. And all of a sudden, the tides really turn on the blocked punt for Chicago. They block a punt, return for a touchdown, 17-7. They're back, in, or 17-10 maybe at that point, uh, back in business. You Really, though, if you look back on the game and watch the Bears' offense, it was kind of miserable throughout the day. They had their moments. I thought DeAndre Swift actually like had a couple a couple plays here or there. His stats weren't great at all, but he he had a few moments where I went, okay, Swift, like Swift can play. You know, Keenan Allen had some catches, but Caleb Williams for the most part was very disappointing. He was just off target a lot of the times. Uh, he tried to extend plays, and this is what Jack always got on him for. He tries to extend plays, and all of a sudden can find himself in trouble where. Earlier in the game, the Bears are on the 25-yard line. He runs back and takes a 20-yard sack. Two plays later, they're out of field goal range. They have to punt the football. There are a lot of miscues from the Bears, whether it was sacks like that, penalties, you know, negative rushing attempts on, on second and five. I thought, as a Bears fan, your, your takeaway is happy with the win, but you're not, you're not giddy from this game. You're just like, I can't believe. I think it's more of, holy crap, how did we win that? Yeah, I'm sure that's a feeling that uh, Bears fans have had a whole lot in recent years of watching this team. In addition to the, oh my goodness, how did we lose that game? Right? That's just the Chicago Bears experience. But yeah, it's neither. Both of these offenses were putrid in the past game, right? Both the Bears and the Titans did, were. So, like, there wasn't. It, it was a tough game for Caleb Williams. He wasn't accurate. He wasn't getting the ball where it needed to go. Bad and it's nice passes, when there's a lot of batted passes. Yeah, it's I think that's just adjusting to the NFL. It's so different playing at USC, right? And again, it's he wasn't unique in this. No rookie quarterback this week. None of the starters threw a passing touchdown. It's so hard to be good in the NFL when it takes time. I didn't see anything that makes me worry about him long term, right? You no. saw the potential of some of these scrambles. You've seen what he's been able to do up until this point. But yeah, averaging 3.2 yards per attempt, his completion percentage over expectation was minus 20%. It was a bad game. He had 93 yards. Even, he had 93 yeah. yards passing. That's at one point in the first quarter. I think their passing yards were negative 14. Like that. That's and, the kind of day it was. And if you want to pound the table and say, we didn't turn the ball over. He had a fumble. It was recovered by the bears, but he could have lost it. No, you, they won this game because the Titans completely imploded. It was, it, it, you know, you mentioned it with the Raiders, the Raiders self-destructed the Titans, maybe two X that it was. And the Titans mistakes were catastrophic too. The pick six that Levis threw to really ice the game or not ice the game, but give Chicago the lead was just, I mean, one of the, one of the worst, you know, we talk about uh, Riley Leonard's throw against Northern Illinois. You got just, and this is something that maybe a young quarterback needs to learn. Just go down. The play's over. Don't make a bad play horrendous. Don't don't make it a yeah. catastrophic play. And no, uh, their win probability, they lost 44% on that throw. They went from yeah. comfortably winning the game to almost certain to lose. Off I of think it was 17-16 at that point. And the Bears offense couldn't do anything. You know, <laughs> the Bears offense didn't move up and down the field at all, really, in the second half. Um, it was one that the Titans like get away from them. One that I'm sure Will Levis is kicking himself over. But if you're a Bears fan, hey, you take it, you move on. You got a rookie quarterback who we all think by midseason is going to get a lot better. And uh, this is just growing pains. And when you can have wins during growing pains, you sign up for it. So I thought, yeah, and again, kind of I don't want to make it sound like it was 100% on Caleb Williams. Bears fans are going to come in. You're incredibly talk about the like dropped Keenan Allen touchdown. That absolutely should have been there. And Keenan Allen is a player who you really hope can catch that. So it's not all doom and gloom, but Caleb Williams and the Bears are just going to have to produce more on offense because you can't count on, in critical moments, a pick six, a punt block, a Will Levis fumble. Like Those were the three most negative plays in the entire game, yep. and you just can't count on that happening every time. And hey, the defense made plays. The defense, 10 QB hits, the Chicago defense was flying around, Soldier Field was rocking. Like uh, They... If they can win those ways, that's great for them right now. Uh, let's go over to the Packers. The big news out of Green Bay today was that Jordan Love will not be placed on IR. They're hoping he's back between weeks four and six. 
you know, quite fitting that Jordan Love would would return for the Viking game uh, as the schedule plays out for them. It's it's the Vikings and then who they have after that. The Vikings followed by the oh, so it's the Titans this weekend. I'm sorry, I'm way off here. The Colts, then the Titans, then the Vikings. Those are the next three opponents for the Packers. He'd be set to come back for the Vikings game, the Rams, or the Cardinals between weeks four and six. Uh, there's a world where Green Bay is even three, uh, is even two and one. Like the Colts and Titans are two opponents that Malik Willis looked really bad when for or has looked really bad in his career so far. But the Titans and Colts are two teams that you could you could potentially escape with the win there. Um, and if Jordan Love comes back in week four, you know, it's really, it's really no sweat. Yeah, I mean, it's the way they're talking. Like the return is expected between week four and six, but that's just sort of reasoning it out. They're still talking like there's a chance that Jordan Love will play this week. I don't think that's he will. I think that's very improbable. But that just that tells you what things are like in the building, right? They expect him to be back soon. It went as what well I, as it could, basically. Fine? Yeah. I just, I find, I will be honest, I find the Packers quarterback plan puzzling for the following reason. They have said that they're planning on starting Malik Willis until Jordan Love is healthy. What? Well, that may, I mean, yeah, that makes you think that he has to be coming back sooner. Because it, let's, say, yeah. let's say Jordan Love was out four weeks, then it's probably worth it to go out and try and get Ryan Tannehill or someone who can be more effective. Unless, get Dobbs, Malik get Willis, someone who can play a game. Unless if Malik Willis behind the scenes has been playing really well, which I, I just I can't imagine. I mean, what, what did we see at the end of that Eagles game, right? He didn't even get the throw off. I know, I know, I know. That's what I said before when I was like, he, he didn't even play well. I went, well, it's one play, but still didn't get the throw off. The Tannehill question is uh, is a fun one to talk about because there are a bunch of reports whether or not the Packers have even reached out to Tannehill at this point, and they have about $16 million in cap space right now if they were to make a move. Um, if it's for one week or two weeks, I don't think you'd do that. But at some point, you know, if Jordan Love were to miss four or five games, I'm not sure that you can afford to lose all of those. Like, there's, there's a certain level of, if you're 0-5 or 0-4, then your season could be done. Like that actually could be the season right there. So this is a really no. tricky time for Green Bay at the moment because they they do have to win a couple of these games. They can't afford to just to lose out up until Love. I don't think they're yeah. good enough to I really just don't think they're good enough to run the table when Love gets back. Yeah, I mean 0 and 4, 0 and 5, that's as bad or worse a record than 2 and 6. And you saw the kind of run it took from Green Bay in order to barely squeak into the playoffs after that start. Now, Jordan Love may well come back and be very good. I think that's a likely outcome. But to light it up like he did then, that's a huge ask. But again, I mean, I, I've said this multiple times this offseason. It's weird how this keeps coming up. Malik Willis is not an NFL quarterback. I don't know what he is. If, if somehow the Packers can make Malik Willis into a functional quarterback, put Tom Clements in the Hall of Fame. Honestly, may give him his own wing if he can do that. I just I do not believe in Malik Willis at all. I don't see how he fits into this offense and what they want to do. But clearly, clearly they see something I don't. On the other hand, though, you said they've got the Colts and then they've got the Titans. I will say this: the Packers do not have the Bears offense, right? They cannot, or the Bears defense, excuse me. They yeah. cannot handle Malik Willis throwing for 93 yards and count on a special teams play and a defensive touchdown. We saw a bad performance against the Eagles. I think it'll get a little bit better, but I am not expecting the defense to be able to carry this team. They are going to need to see something on offense. Yeah, and and if it's Malik Willis, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be tough. So you got to hope you get one of them there. And then something that I've kind of been mulling around my head today, and I'm not really sure where I'm coming down on the take, was just from watching Jordan Love against the Eagles, the Packers offense is explosive. They can score from anywhere on the field on any given play. Like that's just part of the product of having Josh Jacobs, the receivers they have. Jordan Love's got a big arm. But I didn't think he was I didn't think he was great against Philly by any means. There were a lot of throws. Like Kobe Dean had a near pick six, he just dropped it. Love was throw uh, he keeps doing this thing where he throws off his back foot. I know he's got talented arm, but there's a couple times where if he just drives it into someone. I think his receiver can catch it and keep running, and he kind of lobs it, throwing into double or triple coverage, where the run that he had last year, the final 10 games, was essentially flawless. Jordan Love really didn't do anything wrong up until the 49ers game with the turnovers. And I'm not trying to sit sit up here and say that, 
oh, he's, you know, he's, he's going to fall apart as the season goes on. I'm just saying for the Packers to really, really be a Super Bowl contender, I think that they do need that elite Jordan Love. And now coming off an injury where I don't know what the, the chances of re-injuring an MCL sprain are, I, I think there are, it's, it's a little concerning in Green Bay at the moment because you got to win these games without him. And then when he comes back, how good is the team going to be? Are they going to be able to win these games against the Texans, the, the 49ers, without Love being awesome? And I didn't think he was awesome against Philadelphia. No, I mean, the thing that you need to see from Jordan Love and the Packers offense as a whole is more consistency. Yeah. Right. During that great last eight game run and last year, Jordan Love completed 70 percent of his passes. And this game, he completed 50 percent. You can look at success rate. Jordan Love's success rate was 40 percent. Now, they still were ended up being positive on offense because of that deep Jaden Reed touchdown. But usually when you're effective on well less than half of your plays, that's not a formula that correlates to success and was a large part of why they lose. Right. Similarly, they're going to need more out of Josh Jacobs, too. Right. Their biggest running play by far came from that long touchdown run from Jaden Reed. I'm sorry, Jaden Reed is you can't count on him to print a 35 yard rushing touchdown on demand. Like everything on this offense needs to get more efficient and it needs to get more consistent. And if they can do that, Jordan Love will continue being a home run threat. He will continue to be able to make big plays, but they can't forget in light of that, that you have to be able to make the little plays too, to set those up. Yeah. Everyone knows that we'll talk about the Packers as glowing as glowingly as any podcast really on the face of the earth when they, when they deserve it. But at the same time, when they really should have won that Eagles game, that that was a game that they could have taken advantage of very early with the two turnovers. They missed the 43 yarder, stalled out inside the 10 yard line a lot. You convert those field goals to touchdowns, and and, and Green Bay's probably walking out of this game one and zero. Let alone the defense. How disappointing is it to give up? And Philadelphia does this. I think the Eagles are better at this than maybe anyone in the NFL of having long, time consuming drives when they need it. 16 plays, 67 yards, eight up, 7:25 on the clock. Like that's just if the Packers defense, you got to get off the field. I got to find a way because that essentially iced it for Philadelphia. Um, so even though there were a lot of positives for Green Bay, given the uh, the performance of the offense and the explosiveness, the defense, you know, it's starting to collapse in the second half. The, the inconsistencies, those are some of my concerns to go on top of the love injury. But this is very much still a uh, an NFC, big time NFC contender as long as the love injury doesn't deflate them. Well, uh, we'll wrap it up here with the Vikings and the Lions. So the Vikings, as we said, 28-6, dominant win. It was awesome. We know it's the Giants. We're well aware of who the opponent was. But when people were questioning Sam Darnold against the the Giants defensive front, the Giants front seven all week, all we heard was how he's going to get eaten alive. Feels pretty good to see him go 19 for 24 for 208 yards and the two touchdowns. That was just awesome. And Aaron Jones looked great. He finished with 14 carries for 94 yards and a touchdown. Um, It was just a a great, great performance from Minnesota on offense and defense. 12 QB hits, the pick six for Van Ginkle. Bad opponent. We know it. But if you're a Vikings fan like we are, it's uh, it's a great feeling to see them come and just, just absolutely demolish a team they should. Yeah, and I get that it's a bad opponent. People say that over and over again. It's as if they think the Giants aren't an NFL football team of <laughs> NFL level talent. Yes. Like w- winning 28 to 6. I mean, we saw, right, of the Cincinnati Bengals putting away a talentless team is a lot harder than it sounds because they'll still have some stars. They will still have productive players. And like Daniel Jones, even though he's not great and he often struggles, he can be a threat on the ground. He can sometimes make big plays. They added some weapons around him. Like the fact that the Giants offense was so bad. I mean, their percentiles of success with the Giants, it's four with the Vikings. It's 82. They were complete inverses. The The Vikings looked great. And again, you can beat the table that it's a bad opponent all you want. It was an NFL team and they demolished them. And you know, what was the spread, right? The Vikings were favored by a point and a half. Yep. It's not like yep. everybody expected. It's easy to sit back after the game and say, oh, yeah, we knew the Vikings would obliterate them. Well, and I hope you put your money where your mouth is on like an alternate spread Vikings minus 10 and a half. No, people didn't think this was going to happen. And Sam Darnold lit them up. It was the best game of his career in MetLife. The defense was everything that was promised. It's a, It's hard not to get excited. 
And, you know, yeah, sure, we've got a tough game coming up. How'd that go last year? Yeah, this is where it's very important for Vikings fans. Uh, you know, we, look, we had the Norse break. We're cautiously optimistic. It's always the free. No, Notre like, Dame has let me down. I am all in. The Vikings will not break my heart. They're going to do it. It was fun. The front set, I really thought that the, uh, the the defense was flying around. They looked great. It was for an around the NFC North segment, the Vikings, maybe the big winners. Honestly, maybe like if you had to rank the NFC North teams in terms of winners, losers, not winners and losers, but like how excited the fan base should be post week one. You probably go Detroit one, Vikings two, Bears three, Packers four, given the love injury. I think that's that's probably where it falls. Yeah, I mean, this game was proof of concept for everything the Vikings have been talking about all offseason, right? They said, yeah, look, we know the J.J. McCarthy injury or benching before he was injured. It's a disappointment, and people want to see him out here. But we believe in the new guys we're bringing in. We believe in Sam Darnold, and this can be a competitive team. And sure enough, right, the new guys all show up. It's a highly competitive team. And it's one of only two games this weekend that didn't come down to a like nail biter near the end, at least in that slate. I mean, I guess what there was the Cowboys Browns game. There were a few games later in the day that pulled away, but during that slate, that and the Saints Panthers games were the only ones where a team decisively beat their opponents. It felt good. It felt good. And uh, last but not least, the Lions and the Rams. So the Lions come away with the overtime win, twenty six twenty, over Los Angeles. We won't talk about this too long because we did an entire reaction to it that you could check out uh, on YouTube of of uh, the Sunday night football game. But basically, the, in summary, we said great day for the Lions offense. You know, you got to see how explosive Jamison Williams can be, perhaps now that he's healthy and and ready to go. Uh, Amon Ron Laporta basically did nothing and you still beat a very good football team in the Rams. And on the defensive side, Eden Hutchinson was an absolute monster. You know, there's there's work to be done still in the secondary uh, Terry and Arnold got picked on a little bit as the game wore on. Cooper Cup had a huge night. Like you got to try to shore up a little bit there. Um, again, especially when you're going against quarterbacks like Dak Prescott. Um, as we move further on into Dak Prescott, you know Jalen Hurts. There's good quarterbacks in the NFC, um, even if it doesn't quite have the star power that the AFC names do. But yeah, I think overall Detroit was probably the biggest winner because they. Got a huge win at home against a, a very competitive NFC team and kind of cemented, hey, we're here this season. Like, let's, uh, hey, look, the Rams probably should have won. Like, the Rams had them on the ropes, uh, but it's a tough win for a tough Detroit Lions team. Yeah, it's the secondary is certainly going to get tested again next week, right? They were fortunate that Puka Nakua got out of the game pretty early. Between Godwin and Evans next week, it'll be another challenge for the secondary. But I am confident that they will be able to do it. I know that like Jared Goff wasn't as good as people wanted. That's true. And they relied a lot on the run game and Cooper cup. I know he had big looking numbers, right? 110 yards, but that was also with 21 targets where he only averaged five yards a target, which in fact, like that's a pretty good performance when you're waking Cooper cup inefficient and you're limiting. Uh, everybody you know else. what? I'm, I, just, no, look, I, I don't numbers I, say I, one thing, but he had, he had some, Big time catches. I mean, he he, he destroyed them in the, throughout most of the game. They held Matthew Stafford to one passing touchdown. They intercepted Matthew Stafford one time on a nice play in the end zone. I am confident that this secondary will be able to rise to the challenge next week, and they'll be able to continue to do so for the rest of the season. Well, and this is the kind like, of I'm sorry when too. you when you target a player twenty one times. He's going to put up some numbers. 21 targets for 110 yards. That's downright bad. No, no, it was not bad. I mean, some of the he was making big catches, moving the chains. The catch he had at the end of the game was unbelievable. Like Cooper Cup had the rushing touchdown too. He was all over the place. I'm not gonna sit, I'm not gonna sit here and let you say Cooper Cup had an inefficient, bad Sunday night he, football game when he said he, he was inefficient compared to the volume he got. That is just he's the only guy the in the secondary Rams who could do anything after Puka went down. It gives Tyron and, and Cooper Cup, and he's still I, if I were the Rams, I'd be triple teaming him for crying out loud. The guy, the guy who was the only person on the field that Stafford was looking at. Um the interception that was funny with uh the paint in the end zone too, with <laughs> blending in. I just don't think Stafford even saw him. Uh, truthfully, but uh, no, if you're Lions, beat the like there are the elite contenders and then there are the secondary contenders in the NFC. The Rams are a secondary contender, the Bucks are a secondary contender. To, to put yourself firmly in that number one category, 
you got to beat those number two teams. And they have a chance in the first two weeks. They are at home in both of them, but you can beat the Rams, beat the Bucks. you know, establish that separation there. Feel good going into your next your next few weeks. Like this is a Reliance team that could get off to a very hot start. I believe the schedule is kind of light after that, right? Well, yeah. So they they go to Arizona, they host the Seahawks, and then their first real challenge of the year, besides this, October 13th, they go to Dallas. Yeah, it's not as light as I remember. Cardinals, Seahawks, Dallas is are all tough. Then at Minnesota, you know, not not a walk in the park. It, like this is a telling schedule. It's a telling schedule, actually, the more you look at it for Detroit. At Green Bay, at Houston, Jacksonville, at the Colts, like they'll be able to show everyone that they're for real, and we all believe that they are. Um, really good win yeah. for the Rams. For what the, they will need the if Lions. they want to win those games is they need more out of Jared Goff. Jared Goff was barely good enough this game. He certain did, certainly didn't play like a. I'm and I'm a big Jared Goff defender, right? But in this maybe game, the he biggest. did not. He did not play like a quarterback who deserved the monstrous extension he got this off season. I don't think that's a problem because I think longer term, he's going to be a very good quarterback, but this game, you know, they ran 30 times. They dropped back to pass 31 times. Clearly they would rather lean on the run game in this one. And, you know, it might've been Goff just having a bad game, right? That happens. Also look at, look at how they, in overtime, how they just bullied them. I mean, that was probably the game. Oh yeah. I mean, there you're not going to pass the ball just because you're David just running Montgomery. down that road. Yeah. You no, know, when you and that's not Jared Goff's fault. When you've got a great run game, you've got a great run game. But when he went back to pass, it wasn't always great. Mm-hmm. And indeed, some of the bigger plays, there were some great plays, right? That Jameson Williams touchdown was excellent, but he took a couple of bad sacks. There were a couple other bad plays there. I think that this Lions offense is very good. I am not worried about them. But they will, when it comes time to beat a team like Dallas, when it comes time they play Buffalo this year. You know, they play the 49ers this year to beat these explosive offenses. You need to be able to pass the ball effectively. That's going to need some work, but it's week one. Like Dan Campbell said, this team's only going to get better from here. Lions firmly deserving of that number two, most optimistic start to the season in the NFC North. Easily, easily. All right, there you have it. A uh, little, little bit of a recap from the four o'clock games and around the NFC North. We'll be back for a mailbag later this week. We'll be back with Jack and preview cap of the week. Well, producer Zach, uh, anytime touchdown prop, it'll be a lot of fun. So we appreciate everyone who's been sticking with us through uh, through week one of the season and on to week two. The season rumbles on. Hold on. That was a nice ending. But before we end, I got I got to say one thing, please. Um, people think Ziggy's like the nerdy stats guy. And like, maybe that's Uh-oh. true. That's certainly part of it. But here's something I just have to say. If you think that I'm like. I'm always on board with this. Do you know what Jalen Hurts' PFF rating was this weekend, Paul? No, what was it? I have to say something. It was 29. At first, I thought it might be a typo, so I went and double-checked. Bo Nix was a 40. The next lowest player on the Eagles' offense was like a 50 or a 51. I'm... I don't know if I'm crazy. I should we should have somehow put this... I don't know how I forgot to put this in like the Eagles-Packers segment that we ran, but I'm just... I don't know. Did you see something I didn't? I know that Jalen Hurts didn't have a great game, but that game is that's a that's a putrid score. And no, that is this guy is an absolute bum off the street. That is worse than Caleb Williams. 70 like, is like a little bit below average. I don't even know what the numbers mean anymore. I, th- I think they 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 I think it's so almost much. like the way I viewed it a little bit was like academics. Like, you know, you're in the 70s. It's eh. Bees, you're like, okay, yeah. who's, who's well, okay? And they tried to make it more like Madden numbers. It used to be a lot easier to understand, but Arif Hassan actually is a great piece on how PFF sucks now because venture capitalists bought it. But a 29, no, a 29 is frankly, frankly horrifying. That's see. supposed to be the equivalent of a 29 rating in Madden. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I don't know. Sometimes the PFF grades just go over my head. I don't know how you get there. I actually thought Jalen Hurts made a lot of really big plays and and, and I mean, he had the great throw to, to AJ Brown. Like I thought, Jalen Hurts played well. Um, you know, not, no one was great in that game. Like I, again, I don't think Jordan Love was awesome in that game. But Jalen Hurts, yeah, Bryce Young was a thirty-two. Yeah, right. Yeah, so that's, they're that's, saying that Jalen Hurts had a, a worse game yeah. than Bryce Young. I'm sorry, it's I can't, I can't. So I don't know. It's Eagles fans who say, you know, I often laugh. Eagles fans will come here and say we're disrespected. Nobody likes us. Nobody believes in us. Whatever. And I used to think that was just ridiculous, like every team says this. 
But I don't know. That is so disrespectful to Jalen Hurts. They're saying actually that he's well below any like undrafted free agent you could sign. They're the saying Panthers lost game to forty-seven to ten. Yeah, and I get Bryce Young had like a nice little rushing touchdown, but he played one of the worst That's games. That's why I don't his care about PFF. I just don't care about PFF grades. It's it's I I, yeah. I I see what I see and I go off of that. That's what I. Well, mean. this is what's disappointing is like PFF. Within the NFL, PFF is well regarded, not because of this stuff, but because they have other really good products. This public facing stuff they do, you know, it's all fantasy now. It's all this grade, that grade. They used to have a methodology I could understand. Now they won't tell you how they reach their numbers. They just sort of look and glean. Their public facing stuff is garbage. So trust the numbers. Don't get me wrong. I love my stats. I love my analytics. But PFF, big question mark. Yeah, so this is why you watch the end, right? We might just run a ridiculous segment at the end of the show. You never know what's coming. (laughs) Well, there you go. Thanks again to everyone who uh, who listened to this episode, and we'll catch you for our week two preview stuff. (laughs) See you then.